Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really great to be here. Uh, appreciate the invitation from John. John and I have been going back and forth about data, not surprisingly. Uh, and uh, it's great to see so many students here. Uh, I think we're one of the pipelines that we need to create uh, is the pipeline of talent. Uh, and that's what, uh, that's what the students are about here. So it's my pleasure to talk with you about work that we do and that I'm passionate about. And this lecture is almost entirely new data because I'm working on the annual report right now. Uh, and uh, the result is uh, data that I'm not completely sure about and have only seen once or twice myself. So uh, take this with a, a little note of skepticism. Now here are my disclosures. I consult for a lot of companies. That's how I know a lot of these drugs, trying to um, help companies get the best possible drugs for their patients and mine. Here are the things I'm going to talk about. A new era of Alzheimer's therapy. This has been alluded to. Uh, this is a very big topic in the US, and I think it will be a very big topic worldwide. Uh, I'll tell you about our clinical trial observatory and how we run it uh, and how that gives us information about the Alzheimer pipeline and trials. And I'll tell you about uh, some of the key points that have emerged in this year's analysis. And then I'll end with just a discussion of trends and goals, uh, where I think, uh, think the influences are coming, uh, where I think we might be going. So a new era in Alzheimer's therapy, and I'll start with the with the uh, difficult past that we've had. Uh, that is, we had all this excitement starting in 1993 with Tacrin. Uh, four drug, four cholinesterase inhibitors approved before 2001, so in less than 10 years. And then uh, Memantine approved in 2003. And then the great treadmill began. Uh, and it wasn't a valley of death, it was a canyon of death. Uh, and there was enormous period, 18 years, before the next drug was approved, aducanumab uh, 2021, followed by lecanemab 2023. One particularly difficult aspect of this was the spend. Uh, so we looked at this last year in a publication and found that Industry alone, this does not include government investments, industry alone during this period, the spend was $42.5 billion. Uh, so uh, I think that speaks to one thing. One is we don't do it very well, uh, right? And we need, we need to think about how to do trials better, how to have fewer failures and more successes. And there are many aspects to that dilemma, uh, but you can see that the price of not doing it is very, very high. So I've taken the position uh, for the monoclonal antibodies, you know, right now in the US, uh, just we have reds and blues and we have, uh, we have pros and cons for monoclonal antibodies. So uh, I am a pro monoclonal antibody person. So there's marked uh, a plaque reduction. You see in the upper two panels, a patient on placebo, uh, for uh, 18 months, uh, and you see that that green signal, which represents the amyloid on the, on the, uh, uh, the fluoride scan, uh, is unchanged or slightly increased. And then you see on the bottom, you see the patient has a full load of amyloid at the beginning of the, of the 18 months, and at the end, all you see is a high signal coming from the white matter. Uh, because the blood flow from the white matter is slow, and therefore you'll see the signal from the ligand. But you don't see anything in the cortex. As a matter of fact, the amyloid is below detectable levels on that scan. So it has been removed to an amazing, amazing degree. And we have never seen a drug that could do that, right? We've never seen a drug like that. So these are, these are very powerful drugs. They produce about 30% slowing of disease progression. There's been a great debate uh, about whether that is clinically meaningful. There's no question in my mind that if I had a third of my remaining 10 years left, I would want that th additional third of my time. Uh, it's the first disease-modifying therapy for Alzheimer's disease. And in the US, except for two drugs approved for ALS, it is the only this is the only class of disease-modifying medications for any 
neurodegenerative disease. So these are breakthrough agents. That's why I say they define a new era. They also create many, many new issues. Uh, and I think we should get used to this. Science advances should create new demands on our systems so that we can deliver these advances that we're coming up with. That's going to be the constant dialogue that we have now. It's a great dialogue because we want the advances of the science and, the and we, have to, we, have the, we have the transmitter, we have to form the receptor so that we get the integration of uh, the new drugs into our patients. So they're administered intravenously, so now you need infusion centers uh, in order to, to do this. And lacanumab is done, is administered every other week. Um, so this is a lot of infusion. Amyloid-related imaging abnormalities, or ARIA, occur almost all in the first year, but that means you've really got to be on top of these patients for the, for the first year. Because as you pull the amyloid out of the brain, you pull the amyloid out of the vessels, they become leaky, you, know, you get uh, effusion or hemorrhage. Um, very few are symptomatic, very few are serious, but some are, and they're been deaths. Uh, and so we have to be on top of this. This has to be part of the management responsibility that we accept when we deliver monoclonal antibodies. These drugs were tested only in early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, prodromal disease and mild AD dementia. That means these are the only patients that we can safely, that we can give the drug to where we know the safety and efficacy. Well, we don't even identify these patients by and large right now, right? They, they are not identified until they get moderate disease. Most of these patients are not diagnosed. So that's a new demand, is to identify the appropriate patient population. And of course, the financial demands are very much a, a source of, of uh, dialogue right now. CMS or Medicare in the United States has decided uh, that they're going to take a pretty firm stance against these drugs. I think that's unwarranted, unfair to patients with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, the dialogue, I'm sure, is going to continue. But this is a transformative era. No matter how you regard these drugs, they're going to change our healthcare systems. So a little bit about the observatory. So I have a, a grant from the NIA. It's called the Alzheimer Clinical Trial Innovation or Action Initiative. Uh, and with that, we continue the surveillance that we've done for several years of clinicaltrials.gov. Clinicaltrials.gov is the largest uh, clinical trials registry in the world. It is not exhaustive, by the way. You will find a few drugs in the, in the European registry, few drugs in registries in other parts of the world that are not uh, on uh, clinicaltrials.gov, but very few. Uh, we think probably 85% of drugs are, uh, that are tested are registered on clinicaltrials.gov. In the U.S., it's the law. You have to register, uh, and you must report that trial. It must be on clinicaltrials.gov within 30 days of the first patient randomization. Um, so this must be one of the few registries in the world where it's illegal not to be part of the registry. Uh, that's very unusual. Uh, and the outcomes data uh, since uh, 2017 have also been required. Within 12 months of terminating the trial, the, the company or the sponsor, academic, must put the outcomes data on clinicaltrials.gov. About 50% of trialists are uh, are adherent to that requirement. Uh, so it's not very good. Uh, but those data are coming in. We're going to have a look at them soon. So we track all clinical trials and all drugs in development for Alzheimer's disease. We have a sentry system set up on clinicaltrials.gov so we know every day what's happened on clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, we use artificial intelligence and machine learning. We're going to hear a lot about this at this conference. I'm so excited about it. Uh, and we do that to interrogate these data. So here's what it looks like. There are 187 Alzheimer's disease trials in the, United, in, in the world right now that are on clinicaltrials.gov. So for me, this is like 187 laboratories doing the work that I'm interested in. All those trials are registered then on clinicaltrials.gov and all of the data are there. 
Uh, we bring them in to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, where we have the clinical trials observatory, and we apply all of our great techniques uh, on informatics and AI and ML uh, to study these data, organize them, make them comprehensible, and to ask questions about them. We do research studies. Uh, we provide these data to academic investigators. Uh, we'll provide them to biopharmaceutical companies and government agencies, and we're very much interested in data sharing initiatives like DPUK. Uh, we're not quite at the point where that arrow is alive yet. Uh, I think later this year, we will be able to bring the database uh, into all of these activities. Uh, we, I just changed my database, it's much better now, uh, but changing a database is a very slow and challenging process, uh, so we're not quite there. My goal here uh, is to take what we currently do, which is largely descriptive, how many trials are there, how many drugs that do this, how many drugs that do that, into much more of a discovery kind of algorithm and from there to dissemination and transformation. Uh, what we want is, of course, to make trials better, and to do that, we have to understand trials better. Uh, and that's what the clinical trial observatory's goal is. So let me show you some things that we uh, have found interesting about the pipeline. Well, here's the new figure. I love this figure. Uh, uh, you are the first people to see it. I just got it yesterday. Uh, and it's not quite at the resolution that it will be in the final publication, but that's how new it is. Uh, so we've had a lot of fun looking at this uh, and or organizing it. So there are 187 trials, but the, uh, the circles, of course, only has 141 drugs because we put the drugs here. So the inner circle is phase three. Those are closest to a possible approval. Phase two, uh, of course, are the, are the, is the middle circle. Uh, those are, are compounds largely in proof of concept trials. Uh, and phase one is the outer circle. The green uh, slice at the top are all the biologics. Those are mostly monoclonal antibodies, but not exclusively monoclonals. The purple uh, slice of the pie on the right are all small molecules, so those are largely orally administered disease-modifying drugs. The blue slice of the pie are neuropsychiatric agents for behavioral disturbances of Alzheimer's disease, and the orange slice, cognitive enhancers. So a few observations, 78% of the drugs are disease modifying. No question, that's where, that's where most of the energy is, disease modifying. So the fact that we're going to make patients better actually is a very small part of the goal. Uh, we're trying to make their disease progress more slowly. Um, I think we probably could use more emphasis on making patients better. Uh, there are 35% of the drugs are biologics, that's quite a lot. 44% uh, of, the, of, the, of the disease modifying drugs are small molecules. 11% are cognitive enhancers. 11% are for behavioral symptoms. And 28% are repurposed. Those are interesting drugs. And uh, we should talk more about that in the course of the conference. A couple things I'll call attention to. Um, look at phase one for disease modifying biologics at the, right at the top of the circles. And note how much more populated that is than the rest of phase one. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of biologics coming into the pipeline at this point. I think that's not an accident. That's a result of success. Uh, and success breeds interest. So I think that's why you see all those biologics up there. The other is to call attention to the large number, fairly large number of drugs for behavioral symptoms at phase three. Look how crowded that is, the blue point of the circle in phase three. So although it's only 11% of the pipeline, there's a lot of activity right now at phase three in behavioral symptoms, and they're really making progress. I think Brexpiprazole, for example, will be approved this year. That's my guess. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So there's a lot of, lot of interest in that particular aspect of things. So here's another way of looking at it. This now is the number of drugs and the number of trials. Always there's more trials than drugs because some drugs will be in more than one trial. So there are many more in phase two because uh, of course many of them don't make it to phase three. They're either non-efficacious or toxic. Phase one is underrepresented on clinicaltrials.gov because a lot of phase one is done ex-US and is not registered on clinicaltrials.gov. 
On the other hand, I would say that the small numbers in phase one, except for the biologics, is really alarming. Uh, and we need to get more drugs into this pipeline. The only way to get things out of the pipeline is to get things into the pipeline. Uh, and I think we're not doing a very good job of that. The number of trials might be increasing. I uh, Just to call attention to this trend from 2020 to 2022, it may be that better science is leading to, to more trials. I hope so. Uh, and we're in a good position now to see whether the success of aducanumab and lecanemab leads to uh, an explosion of interest, which some people are forecasting. Uh, we'll see. I hope so. Uh, the new trials that are coming into the pipeline are pretty variable. Again, I'm hopeful that this is a trend from 2021 to 2022. You see, 2018 has, was a really great year. Uh, a lot of new drugs came into the pipeline that year, a, a disproportionate number. Um, then it was sort of stable around 50 new drugs uh, coming into the pipeline. This is across all phases, one, two, and three. Uh, and then uh, in 2021, it went down, recovering now in 2022. We'll see what happens in 2023. I'm hoping that that's a trend. Now, here's an interesting observation that we saw for the first time, uh, and that's that the fate of trials in the pipeline uh, looks like there are more uncertain outcomes. So uncertain in this graph uh, rep uh, applies to drugs that, whose outcome is either unknown, that is they have not been updated in at least two years, they're terminated, we know that, or they're withdrawn, we know that. And look at 2021, 2022, and now our data from 2023. Uh, and you can see that there's a steady increase in the uncertain outcomes of trials. Here's my guess. My guess is that the recruitment periods are so long that people wind up stopping or abandoning the trial. Uh, and I think uh, we need to interrogate that. We need to understand it. We need to stop it if it's true. Uh, so this is the kind of data that alerts us to adverse trends in the pipeline. Are we seeing the start of biologics here in, th in Alzheimer's therapeutics? I think so. Um, I pointed that out in the, in the map. 48% um, of all phase one drugs are, are uh, all phase one trials uh, are biologics. Um, so that's a lot compared uh, to phase two and phase three. Uh, and we'll see whether that continues to be a trend. Now, here's something uh, that Vanessa uh, uh, referred to. Here's the, the length of the trial in light purple and the length of recruitment for that trial in dark purple. This is terrifying, right? Every, in every case, the period for recruitment exceeds the period of exposure for the drug. And then look at trials for neuropsychiatric symptoms. When you want to recruit a trial of a patient who both has Alzheimer's disease and he is agitated or and is psychotic, those trials are really hard to do. There's about a tenfold difference between the period of exposure and the period of recruitment for that trial. And you, a lot of you probably know that. I see some shaking heads here. Uh, and certainly I've experienced this in the trials that I've been involved in. Uh, so again, we need better ways to identify these patients. I love that idea of precision recruitment. Uh, and and we, should, we should embrace that, and that should be true for neuropsychiatric symptoms as well as other kinds. Here are the CADRO. Uh, I don't know if you guys use CADRO the way I do. I happen to like it. This is a common Alzheimer's disease research ontology. It is a list of all of the recognized targets for Alzheimer's disease, and therefore we can line up the drugs according to their targets. Um, what you see is that transmitters and receptors not... Uh, not uh, uh, unexpectedly are a large category because, of course, that includes all of the neuropsychiatric and cognitive enhancing drugs as well as some of the DMTs. Amyloid, pretty well represented. Uh, tau is somewhat less represented. Inflammation and synaptic plasticity are extremely well represented in the pipeline. Those is, that's where the action is right now. So those four targets, not counting transmitters, account for 71% of all the drugs in the pipeline. 18% of the agents are for amyloid and 10% are for tau. So 72% of the pipeline is non-canonical. 
Uh, and I want to emphasize that because we often hear, oh, we're, way, we're investing way too much in amyloid. Well, we're, inventing, we're investing 18% of the supportive trials in amyloid. Uh, it's not a huge amount of the pipeline overall. Uh, so I, I think the idea that, we're, that uh, this is a pipeline devoted uh, to amyloid is wrong. Inflammation is actually, beyond transmitters, the most represented uh, uh, target uh, in the pipeline. Repurposed agents, I'll just comment on them. Again, they're the 28% of all drugs. Most of them are in phase two. A few make it to phase three. Why are there any repurposed drugs in phase one? Well, it's because sometimes you're not confident of the dose when you take it into dementia if it's been developed in a young person uh, as, or, or the side effects uh, profile that might be present in a 75-year-old that are not present in a 35-year-old. Uh, so sometimes you've got to take it back to phase one and take another look, uh, but mostly uh, these drugs are in phase two and a few are fewer in phase three. How about participants? Um, this flabbergasts me, really. Um, to do all of the current trials in the pipeline, we need about 58,000 patients. You know, phase one, 1,700, phase two, 13,000, uh, phase three, 41, 42,000. Uh, we have too few trial sites. It's not just the UK, it's everywhere uh, we have too few trial sites. We have to get more. This forces slow recruitment and it forces globalization. Globalization is fine, uh, but then we need a lot more tri trial sites globally than we currently have. So the numbers are, uh, are, uh, need to be addressed. How about global participation in trials? Um, well, most trials are done in the United States. 44% of all trials are conducted in the US. Well, we're a big country and, and, and we have a, have a healthcare system that will pay for it, so uh, this is why that happens. Um, but um, if you look at phase three, 55% of, of all trials are global. So when you get to phase three, when you get to the bigger trials, by and large, those are usually going to be global with both North American and non-North American sites. Uh, so the globalization of trials is extremely important. Consider this. On our index date, there were six trials in the Russian Federation and there were four trials in the Ukraine. Sort of a staggering thought, isn't it? So the trials, of course, were suspended, but the patients were on either drug or placebo, right? That didn't stop. So data has to be collected, patients have to be followed, side effects have to be monitored in a war zone. Not so easy to think about. But when you think about our world in general, it's a world of extreme circumstances. We have wars, earthquakes, mass displacements, and severe weather, and we need a plan for this because there's always going to be patients in these places. Uh, so that's an area where we need to pay more attention. Now here's something about the UK. If we take all the North American sites out and look at the dementia trials, the largest number of trial sites in the U in, in, is in the UK, 32 sites. That's pretty good. Uh, then you see how they're spread across Spain, France, Poland, Japan, uh, Italy, Germany, Korea, Sweden, Puerto Rico. So there are very few trials in low and middle income countries. There are four in Turkey, four in South Africa, and two in Peru. Um, that's interesting, and I just agree so much with what was said early, that trials are so important. They provide science infrastructure. They provide science education. They allow us to have efficacy and toxicity information in non-white populations. They allow us to recruit more easily. They bring income into the country. They bring cultural learnings. And of course, most patients with dementia live in low and middle income countries. Uh, so it is somewhat ironic that that's not where we do the trials. But of course, it, that's for financial and cultural reasons. But it's, it, it says this is a problem to be solved. Uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, it becomes obvious when we look at this distribution of sites. The funding of clinical trials. Um, industry uh, funds most trials. 58% of all trials are funded by industry only. And of course, they are also important uh, to funders in the public-private partnerships. Uh, industry uh, funds 71% of phase, one, uh, phase three trials. 
So most of the late stage trials are industry based. Uh, in the US, uh, and this is sort of federal in general, the way clinicaltrials.gov um, works, uh, the federal uh, sources pay for 32% of trials and 68% uh, of phase two trials. Uh, so uh, there's most of the government and federal uh, investment is in phase two proof of concept. Now that's important because we often think that when we do a repurposed drug, and uh, I'll get to repurposing in a second, but when we, most of these drugs are repurposed and we often think we're going to develop a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease, and we almost never are. So here's that part of the story. Um, so industry almost never sponsors uh, repurposed drugs. Public-private partnerships almost never do. Non-government, uh, non-NIH government sources almost never do. Uh, so most of the funding for repurposed drugs uh, in phase three, phase two, phase one uh, are from the federal sources. Now, supposing you have a positive trial, as I did, Resagiline. I showed Resagiline show, slowed the loss of cortical met, uh, hypometabolism on PET, um, and that there were other associated clinical findings. Uh, that's a repurposed drug. You can't do a thing with it. There's no company that will produce it. There are no company that will test it at phase three. There are no company that will disseminate it. So we have to realize that phase two federally sponsored trials have a really important purpose. They're proof of concept. Uh, we should be testing all the novel biomarkers. We should be testing all the novel outcomes, all the digital outcomes, and we should realize that they are great training opportunities for industry and for academics, but they rarely will produce a new drug for Alzheimer's disease. I'm coming to the end. We're probably getting prior to these graphs. Um, we can look into the future uh, and just see kind of what the readouts are going to be like. Uh, so here I'm doing this by half year uh, epochs. Uh, you can see that the small molecules in phase two in the dark blue read out early. We're going to know about those soon. Uh, the uh, the, the uh, small molecules in phase three read out somewhat more slowly and the biologics very slowly. They're the ones that are in these long prevention trials. So we won't know until 2027 what some of these drugs are doing. In, those are in trials that are currently in place. So trends and goals, um, the things that I see, biomarkers, um, ATX, and I think we're gonna hear about X here quite a lot, uh, in plasma, isn't it great that we have plasma biomarkers? How fantastic is that? Uh, imaging, of course, is growing and omics are growing. Big data and bioinformatics, big theme here. Uh, in silico drug design, AI for drug discovery, electronic medical records, uh, all of those things are playing their role. Platforms, uh, such as IPS cells, but there are many more. Digital outcomes, remote monitoring and continuous data collection, very important and are going to be important trial outcomes. Diversity of trial participants, we have heard the emphasis on that already, particularly important in the US, where about 3% of our, of our uh, participants are black and about 12% uh, of the population is black. Prevention trials are going to be emphasized more. So I'm thinking about metaneuro. This is, I think, what John's shared vision is toward the comprehensive understanding to advance uh, treatment development. A network of networks connecting human, animal, clinical trial, and drug development information. And there are many of these networks that, we, that John is trying hard to bring together into, into one place so that we can use them all. The ones that stand out for me, Model AD and Treat AD are two animal model uh, databases that are really great. The AD Knowledge Portal, terrific place to get information on the federally funded uh, trials in the US. All's GPS, very interesting way of looking at drugs. Sage Bio Networks, of course, ADNI, uh, clinicaltrials.gov, and the Clinical Trial Observatory, and many more. Uh, so we need to get all these data together so that we can really understand what's going on from the animal uh, all the way to the human level. So let me summarize. And uh, Simon, I haven't seen my five minute mark, so uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll just assume I'm on time. Now we're in a new era of Alzheimer's therapeutics. It's so exciting to me. Uh, we have disease modifying drugs for the first time. Uh, and we have biomarkers for the, for, that are enormously important. 
the anti-animaloid monoclonals are disease-modifying therapies. And the clinical trial observatory that I've presented to you provides insights into the dynamics and some of the challenges of drug development. This is the sort of the 30,000-foot look at clinical trials. Most late-stage uh, trials are funded by industry, so that's an important collaboration. You're thinking about how to grow trials here. Well, that industry collaboration is critical. Most government-sponsored trials involve repurposed drugs and proof-of-concept trials, and I've emphasized that those are training uh, and testing opportunities. Late-stage trials are global, and we need to think about that globalization. There's a lot of challenges there. And data sharing will accelerate the achievement of all of our goals. So thank you. I'm, I could take a question or two? Okay, great. Tampa from Brain Cures. Uh, so thank you for your fantastic presentation. I was just, uh, my question is, uh, knowing everything we know about the blood-brain barrier and everything, why has the, uh, the field moved so aggressively into biologics? Uh, and how can we change that in the future? What a great question. Um, you know, we get one one-thousandth of the, of, the, of the monoclonals across the blood-brain barrier. One one-thousandth. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, so what's being done? A uh, couple of things. It, the Roche, for example, has the Brain Shuttle program. I like that program a lot. Uh, use a transperon uh, receptor to uh, bring the gantanarumab into the brain. Uh, uh, focused ultrasound has had some interesting outcomes at this point. Um, it's a little hard for me to envision quite how that's going to work, but it's, it's, an, it's an investigation worth looking at. Um, there's a, the other side of the blood-brain barrier, is there anything we can do about aria, and would we undo the treatment effect if we were able to limit the aria? Um, so I think there's some interesting, uh, there's a lot of interesting issues right now around the blood-brain barrier. One is getting across it, and the other is can we control this uh, interruption that's occurring with the monoclonals uh, without uh, uh, undoing the treatment effect? Um, so thanks for the question. It's really important to think about the blood-brain barrier. And maybe you have some ideas. We'll hear, maybe we'll hear about it in the discussion section. Yes? Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, so in your initial slides, you mentioned that now we have lucanumab. We're thinking about what participants should be going into trials or what patients should be going into trials. So with the ATN framework, obviously, there is the push, or at least there's, there's the idea that we can be identifying people preclinically and treating them. But, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I wonder whether you think that is a realistic expectation that at some point we'll be treating people who are preclinically, uh, you know, who are in preclinical stages, they're healthy, but, you know, they've got some sort of an ATN biomarker. Uh, we know that some companies, for example, like Roche, you know, cancelled their whole preclinical program because they assumed that the DMTs, the anti-amyloid DMTs, are going to be too toxic to ever really try, you know, trial in pre or you know, implement in preclinical populations. I guess what, the, the, to summarise the question, what, what do you think needs to happen in order for there to be a sort of a treatment pathway for people in preclinical AD? Yeah, really, again, really great question. We want to prevent Alzheimer's disease, right? We want our patients to have a dignified end of their life, whether cognitively intact and die of cardiovascular disease or something else that we haven't been able to prevent. That's our goal. Um, so that is best achieved through prevention rather than through treatment of, of a symptomatic individual. Right now, we only have data on symptomatic individuals, and it's going to be quite a while before the prevention trials read out. It's about uh, we're going to hear, of course, about A4 this year. I'm not optimistic about that, uh, given the history of uh, solanezumab. Maybe I'll be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but if I'm not wrong, then it's going to be, a, I think, about four years before we have the first prevention trials read out. But is that a direction we should be going? Yes. Are the biomarkers going to help us? Yes. You know, all the tools are starting to be in place to make that happen. 
so uh, I really think we will be doing more in that direction. And we need to figure out how to get some sort of acceptable earlier readout. Um, for your trial is a long time to wait, thousands of patients. Uh, and in the meantime, of course, thousands of patients, millions of patients are crossing that line between asymptomatic and symptomatic. Um, so there are many reasons for us to try to do the innovative trial. I love these ideas that you put forward for us. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to see if we, can, if, if we can address this problem more aggressively than the current structure allows. Oh. My name is Anders Wallen from Sweden. Nice uh, to see you, Anders. Thanks for coming. Hello, and uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, for, um, I agree with you. This is proof of concept. I mean, the Lekamenumab story. So, so it's worth uh, going on in this direction. And, but there has been a lot of trials without success. Uh, shouldn't we think about other targets for, for cognitive impairment? The vascular, vascular part of the brain might also be important. Uh, I know a lot of uh, phase three, phase two trials and phase one trials in, in uh, vascular cognitive impairment, but there are, for some curious reason, very few phase three trials. And wh why is that? Could, could you comment on that? You, I know you are experienced also in vascular cognitive impairment and different uh, clinical expressions. So, um, is it a question of um, too, people are too much occupied by the amyloid cascade idea, uh, or is it easier to get the money for that type of research? Or, are there other more uh, biological reasons why it's not so easy to um, influence or intervene with vascular cognitive impairment? Yeah. Well, Anders, for those of you who don't know, is an expert in, in vascular dementia and vascular compromise in dementia. Um, so I don't know the answer to your question, Anders. One of the really fascinating observations about the pipeline is we often say, why aren't we doing more combination therapy? It's pretty obvious, right? That if you have 30% of slowing with aducanumab or lecanemab, you have 70% that's not accounted for, right? Uh, that probably needs something else. Um, so the one exception to that in the pipeline uh, is the vascular segment. Uh, and their combination trials are I would say almost half of all the trials are combination trials. And of course, they're trying to treat combinations of vascular risk factors in order to limit uh, cognitive decline. Um, so that's just an interesting observation. I don't think we have the good biomarkers for vascular dementia and for vascular aspects of dementia that we need. Um, but the biomarkers are, are growing quickly. I see that there's a presentation here on the biomarkers we need. Um, and uh, so as I think the, the field is changing. Yes, I have to, one more minute left, I think, Simon. Oh, okay. Um, uh, and uh, uh, so there's, there's a lot to be done. Vascular is so important, uh, but we don't have the same tools there that we have for amyloid and tau at this point. Jeff, thank you for your talk. Uh, Tom Blackburn. Um, one of the things with regard to uh, the various drugs you identified, uh, and you highlighted the neuroinflammation area, what do you think are the challenges there with regard to uh, clinical design you know, for such drugs, uh, looking at the prodomal versus the sort of longitudinal aspects of uh, Alzheimer's? Yeah. Great, great question. And I think we should have this conversation privately because there are so many things that could be thought about, but let me just give you a few reflections on this. One of the things that struck me as I look, looked at the roughly 20 anti-inflammatory agents in the pipeline is that almost none of them have the same target within inflammation. Because inflammation is a vast category, right? Uh, so you have everything from TREM2 antibodies uh, to curcumin. Um, and, and so there are just a, a huge variety of targets that are being explored in the inflammatory pathways. 
They probably need different populations and different outcome measures, uh, but we're not at that level of sophistication. And as you know, we don't really have great inflammatory biomarkers at this point. We've got the astrocytosis side, you know, on, on GFAP, but, you know, do we have a real good microglial marker? The imaging is sort of so-so. There's nothing in the plasma. Uh, there's YKL40 in the CSF. It means you have to get a lumbar puncture. We, we really need better biomarkers for inflammation in order to inform the trials. Uh, and the fact that there are so many targets within inflammation makes those biomarkers particularly, uh, particularly uh, important. I'll tell you just one thing that I'm really excited about that we're doing. So you can map disease pathways like inflammation. And you can map uh, drug response pathways that are known. And you can look at the proximity of those and generate a proximity score. So we're trying to do that for all of the anti-inflammatories right now in the pipeline to see whether we could predict which ones are going to have a bigger effect based on a proximity score. Because I think that's the kind of big data application that we, that we want in order to begin forecasting the results of trial and testing our own forecast to make them better and better over time. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question for Jeff. And I'm going to be around the whole meeting, so you can't get rid of me. And if you want to come and talk with me, I'll be happy to speak with you. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on the American bias of all this, because I'm always really excited to hear about these things, but I'm also quite nervous about what happens when we get to the end and we have something that we have got approved. Um, because I'm, from the patient perspective, I'm quite nervous that the patients get too excited or that they might not be geographically able to access any drugs that we do approve um, and I'm just I'm always scared when with stuff like this that it becomes a situation where we're talking about privilege for access and I just wondered if you could comment a little bit on that and ensuring that when we do have these drugs we do get them to people um, without certain barriers being in the way and how we address that. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite get the question. Did you get the question? That, uh, I didn't quite catch exactly what you wanted me to concentrate on. Essentially, what we do about the, the geographic barriers to drug access uh, when we have these approved drugs. Yeah. Um, so uh, there are so many reasons to try to put clinical trial sites in low and middle income countries. Um, one of the organizations that's doing that is the Global Alzheimer Platform, uh, and one of our agendas is to put uh, trial sites, beginning, I think, with natural history studies uh, in uh, low- and middle-income countries, because, you know, you've, you have to get the staff uh, and it experienced, you've got to get the infrastructure in place, uh, and you'd like to know what happens to an untreated patient, if possible, and then introduce the drugs as soon as possible. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. The other is, we need more trial sites in the UK. We need more trial sites in the US. Uh, you know, we need really great trial sites um, in, you know, in so many places. You see those terrible recruitment figures. Um, so uh, there are many, um, many reasons to put trial sites um, uh, more, uh, uh, more distributed globally, but there are also many reasons just to, just to grow trial sites in general so that we can test these drugs faster. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much.